Welcome to 761 Robotics, lecture number 11, Control of a Two-Link Arm. In this lecture, I want to look at how to come up with the joint torques to force the two-link arm to follow a certain path. And here the path that I want is to trace out a square. In two seconds, go along one side, t equals 4, 6, and 8. Now to do that, I need to find the dynamics. We did that in the previous lecture. This is the dynamics of a two-link arm. In order to specify the torque, I need to know the joint angles, their velocities, and accelerations. That's the path planning part. Once we specify the certain path, define the position of the tips at each point, which then defines the angles. So, using path planning, the spline curve fitting, this is the tip position. I start out moving in the x direction, then the y direction, then the negative x and y. So here's the tip position versus time. Once I know the tip positions, I can calculate the joint angles versus time using the inverse RR routine. Once I know the joint angles, I can calculate the, oh, there's the joint angles versus time. Again, you can see the cosine interpolation. Once I know the joint angles, I can tell you the velocities and accelerations, and from there, tell you the torque. Once I know the desired joint angles, I can then use the feedback control law. Um, essentially, each motor looks like it has inertia and ignoring the other terms. I basically have the torque is the force is mass times acceleration. Torque is inertia times angular acceleration. If I use a PD feedback control law, then I wind up with, this is my differential equation, the roots to JS squared plus DS plus P tell you how the system will behave. The real part tells you the settling time. The complex part tells you how it oscillates. That's your PD control law. Choosing P and D uh, to specify the poles of the closed loop system. Assuming J is 5, which is the worst case for the first mass, to place the closed loop poles at minus 4 plus J4, which is kind of an arbitrary spot, that just tells you that J S squared plus D S plus P should be here. I know J is 5, worst case, so D should be 40, P is 160. Uh, the second link, the inertia of worst case is 1. So to put the poles in the same spot, I want D is 2, P is 2. So that's your PD control law. This is the proportional gain. And here's the 40, 160 from the first calculations. And the second one, the 2 and 2, wasn't quite stiff enough due to gravity. So I just kind of beefed them up to 8 and 32. Uh, basically, it's your S squared plus 8S plus 32. Put the poles at minus 4 plus minus J4. With that, I can now see how the robot will behave. So here's my PD control law. The torque is the proportional gain, 160, times the difference in the desired angle versus the actual angle, and 40 times the velocity. And this is times 0. I'm going to take that out in just a sec. Likewise for T2. If I run this, this is how the robot behaves with a PD control law, where my set point, the blue line for the robot, traces out a square. And kind of notice the actual angle, the dark blue line, is lagging behind. That's typical of a PD control law. It's feeding back the difference between the two. I need a difference to provide a torque. In addition, I've got gravity pulling it down. So, the blue line likewise is below the light blue line. So it sort of is working. It is sort of tracking the set point, but it's not tracking very well. The biggest reason it's not tracking is gravity. Gravity is pulling down the robot, so likewise it's below the desired angle. Well, we know the dynamics from before are such. I've got inertia, Coriolis forces, gravity forces. This gravity force is fairly significant, so I could do better if I compensated. I know what the force is due to gravity, so let's add the negative of that to cancel gravity. So 
So I take the same PD control law and take the torque that I calculated, add a term to cancel for gravity. Now what you're going to have is pretty much the same. It's a PD control law, but now I've got feed forward control due to gravity. I know the joint angles versus time because I calculated it from the path planning. I know what the torque is due to gravity. So let's just throw that, that in there and compensate. So this is what you get. This is similar to what you'll be doing in the homework. It's adding terms one at a time to a robot as you trace out a different path. Here, notice that since I'm compensating for gravity, I'm no longer falling below it, but I'm still lagging behind. And the lagging behind is necessary because I'm feeding back the difference in the two angles. If the difference is zero, if there was no lag, I'd have no input. And I need a torque to make it follow. That's gravity compensation. I can do better. There is the Coriolis forces as well. These guys right here. Again, if I know the angles, I know the velocities. I can calculate what the effect of the Coriolis forces are. In the simulation, I can calculate these. That's once another derivatives. Here's the Coriolis forces based upon the desired joint velocities. So if I now have PD control compensating for the Coriolis forces, compensating for gravity. We'll track even better. Here the Coriolis forces aren't real significant mainly because the motion is so slow. If you approach the singularity, like the origin, or the outer, outer limit, then the Coriolis forces get much more significant. Uh, but here, they'll be almost the same as they were before. Now let this complete. You notice the tracking is getting better. It's still lagging behind, but it's still getting better. Now we'll start adding some feed-forward control. The feedback we're using right now is just a proportional term. What that does in the transfer function, I've got a P over P, DC gain is 1, but at higher frequencies, the gain is less than one. That's causing the lag. If I were to feed it in the DS term right here, this is close to canceling. But to do that, I need to know the derivative of the desired angle. That's not really a problem. Because I know the desired angle. I know the actual angle. So if I just instead do the difference between the desired angle and the actual angle, this is a feed-forward term. I'm pre-biasing the torque based upon the derivative of angle. By doing that, I'll get better tracking. Essentially, as the motor wants to move, I'm going to apply extra voltage to get the motor to move, so I don't have, have to have quite as much air. And it is much better now. Get a little bit of a lag still, but much, much better than it was before. So that's PD feedback with gravity compensation, with Coriolis force compensation, and feed, feed forward control for the derivative. The last version is they'll add acceleration feedback. 
And there, again, I know what the joint velocities are. I know the desired position. I also know the desired acceleration. From the acceleration, I can calculate the effect of the inertia and how much torque I need to overcome the acceleration. Which would be down here. Again, I know the joint acceleration, the desired acceleration. I know the angles, so I can calculate the inertia matrix. Once I know this, I know how much torque I need to provide that acceleration. And now what I have is PD control with gravity compensation, with Coriolis force compensation, with feed forward control for velocity, feed forward control due to acceleration. Put it all together, and I've got a controller for a two-link robot arm. Note, in order to control this, I have to define the desired path. I need to know its first derivative. I need to know its second derivative. Given all that, I can calculate the gravity term, Coriolis terms, velocity feed forward term, acceleration feed forward term, plus a PD feedback controller. And I have a robot following the desired path. So that's lecture number 11. The homework is very similar. For a slightly different robot, determine the dynamics, determine the feed forward terms, um, compensate for gravity, compensate for Coriolis forces, and have it trace out a different shape rather than a square. And that's lecture number 11 for ECE 761.